Okay, we'll continue with the second half of the course. And first the question is, what does blocked oxygen level dependent contrast measure, T2 contrast, T2 star contrast? We first explained that there is a change in tissue susceptibility, that there's a gradient in tissue that creates an, a, a, a reduction of the T2 star depending on what is its level. So what is the physiology behind it? And basically, we know from brain physiology, and we've seen that in course seven just before Easter, that blood flow increases without much of an increase in oxygen consumption. So what is the consequence? Well, the consequence we've seen from Fick principle, blood flow increases, oxygen consumption does not, so there is the oxygen content in the effluent from the brain, so that is in the veins, the oxygen content increases, and therefore the deoxyhemoglobin content decreases. So if we look at it from fixed principle, then the oxygen concentration going in, in the arteries, minus the oxygen concentration going out in the veins, is given by the rate of oxygen consumption divided by the blood flow. And so if blood flow increases without the oxygen consumption decreasing, then this increases, this ratio decreases, so the difference has to decrease. And there is a relationship between oxygen content measured by the arterial pressure of oxygen in millimeters mercury related to the saturation of the hemoglobin. This is a monotonous relationship here so that a change in oxygen content in the blood will result in a degree, change in the degree of saturation of the hemoglobin and therefore a change in susceptibility in the blood vessel. And that's illustrated here. So we have, normally we have a 90 degree saturation. So what is the hemodynamic response to activation? Blood flow increases, deoxyhemoglobin decreases, and therefore the bold signal, the T2 star weighted signal, increases. There's also an effect on blood flow. Blood flow goes up, physiology, uh, blood volume, excuse me. Blood volume also goes up. Since the volume goes up, there is a increase in deoxyhemoglobin and therefore a decrease in bold signal. Sort of competing effect, but the blood flow dominates. So in, in essence, in functional MRI, and for those of you we're taking Dimitri van der Wille's course, of course, there's not, not much new here, but is a, the signal is related to a change in blood flow, change in blood volume, and change in oxygen consumption. So if we look at the brain, the thinking brain, this is what it is. In red are the blood vessels. They supply, provide the supply of nutrients, such as oxygen glucose, to the brain cells. If we now take this box and look inside, then we see there's a very intricate architecture of the blood vessels that makes up our imaging voxel. And so I'll illustrate with a cartoon now what happens during brain activation. So you're tired, it's Friday afternoon, you have your eyes closed, don't see much, and suddenly I'm saying something interesting, you open the eyes, and now what happens back here in the head? We're going to look at that, the sequence of events. Okay, so we have, we have the blood vessel supplying the tissue, that's the artery. We have the arterioles, the branching. Then we come to the capillary bed here. In the capillary bed, we have the astrocytes and the neurons, the brain cells that allow us to think. And then the blood, of course, has to go somewhere. It's going into the venules and then combined into the vein. So that's essentially, if you look in a unit that does thinking in what in terms of blood flow is happening. So now what happens when you open the eyes? You go from dark to opening the eyes. Okay, before we go that, this is typically on the uh, dimension of one to two centimeters. So there's activation of the brain cells, blood flow increases, and the vein is oxygenating. This is illustrated by this subtle change in color. Now that change in color is actually real. So if you cut yourself in, at the foot, you'll see that stark blood coming out. If you do the same thing and you actually not have the foot versus 
uh, towards the floor, but you have it horizontally, and you put some heating pads on it that accelerate the blood flow, and then you cut, the blood that comes out is reddish in color. That's because of the oxygenation. So we have, following the activation of the neurons, we have increase in blood flow, decrease in deoxyhemoglobin, blood gets reddish, and what is now the effect on the T2 star weighted signal? So we'll look now here at the time course. This is in seconds here, horizontally. Percent signal change, so this is a 2% signal change. We have the activation, and a few seconds later, we have a change in the T2 star weighted MRI signal. This is with the gradient echo sequence that we've talked, so we'll see a change in the MRI signal on the order of a few percent, and that's essentially the basis for determining what brain areas are involved in what brain function. We'll cover very briefly um, how this is done in reality. Again, this is not up uh, describing you all the state of the art, but it gives you the gist of what's involved in generating these activation maps. So you start out with a T2 star weighted image, and then you can, one thing that you can do is you take the image acquired during the task, looking at light, for example, listening to sound or touch, moving your fingers, whichever, and you do a difference of the two images, and you can see here there's activation. There's a difference. Now, this difference image was done nearly 25 years ago with the first fMRI studies in humans. This is how one showed that there was indeed a change in signal. The reality is this is no longer done, so what is now done is one acquires these T2 star weighted images every so often, typically on the order of seconds or subseconds, one obtains a time series. So if we look at a pixel or an area in the brain, what we see is the signal does these kind of patterns here up and down, and this is actually linked to the task. In this case, it was a task, a repetitive task, doing the same thing over and over again, and the top graph shows you what the task was. That's controlled by the experimenter, and the bottom shows you the signal that's measured in the brain. So there's the off state and the on state. You could say the same thing. It's you're looking at a visual stimulus for a certain amount of time, that will be on, and then there is no visual stimulus, that will be called off. Or state A and state B is more precise, because our brain is never off. Even when we think it is off, it still thinks. So now, what comes next? Statistical analysis, and lots of it. So this is a statistical method. How do you decide which brain region is activated? It's based on the ability to correlate the image in your pixels with the task pattern that's been designed by the experimenter. So after this statistical analysis, one obtains a statistical significance image, or a, a z-score map, that just tells you what is the probability that this particular pixel is indeed correlated to the task at hand. That's, in essence, the data that's behind it. That's going to look very noisy. So what one does is thresholding the z-score map, and those z-scores that are considered statistically insignificant are displayed as zero. They don't show up in the map. And the rest is, depending on statistical strength, is color-coded. So this gives you a threshold, a statistical image. It's basically the same thing as taking a standard statistical test and say, if the significance is above, the p-value is above 0.05, I consider it insignificant, I'll set it to zero, no significance. And only below that, I give it a color code. If p is 0.01, it has a stronger color. And then, lastly, this activation map obtained on a T2 star weighted image it, with a T2 star weighted sequence, gradient echo sequence, is then overlaid on an anatomical image to show where the activation was, similar to the fusion that we have seen with SPECT and CT and PET-CT, except here it's all done within MRI. And so one can see in this particular task that this was the, data, the basis of the data. This particular task produces activation in this area here. <coughs> 
OK, so that's for the fMRI, very brief an introduction, how brain function is measured. Um, maybe one remark, you don't need to worry. For so far, we're not able to tell well what you're exactly thinking, because it has to be linked to the task. But one can very well figure out which brain regions actually are synchronous in what we call resting state, lying there doing apparently nothing. One can see actually very much that almost the entire brain has somewhere a correlation where there's activity that's correlated. So now, let's look at what the effect is of magnetic susceptibility differences between the air and the tissue. Air is paramagnetic, tissue is diamagnetic, and this creates um, a difference in susceptibility. And like with the vessels, this creates a gradient in magnetic field due to the susceptibility that does change gradually in space, and that creates effects on the T2 star weighted image. So it is a gradient echo image acquired. And now you can see this is an ugly image. It's not as nice as before. Here it's black. Here it's black. Any idea why this is black? The eyeballs would be here. This is the center of the brain. Why is it black in the front? OK, so we got the nose. We got the sinuses. The sinuses go fairly in. The sinuses is air-filled space. Therefore, paramagnetic oxygen is in there. So this creates a magnetic field distortion around the sinuses and um, this signal loss. What are these two black signal voids on this side? So this is an image like this going through here. Up here, we have the sinuses. What do we have on the side? That's air filled. The ear canal. So there's paramagnetic air in the ear canal. That also creates distortions. The sinuses, the effect is less pronounced if you have a cold, so it's filled with liquid. You can't, of course, fill all our spaces with liquid. So here's the sinus, ear canal. Here's another example. It's an implant. Somebody had a medical implant in this scan, and that created a signal dropout that also produces artifacts that is signal areas in the image that have no signal. So how can one minimize these effects? We want to get in the end. We don't want to just do brain function analysis. We want to get also diagnostically relevant images. So how can one minimize these effects? Well, one is will reduce TE. Remember the gradient imperfections, delta B times time times TE, that's the effect on the phase. So if one reduces the TE, the, the degree of the time given to the magnetization where it can go out of phase, dephase, due to the static inhomogeneity, is reduced. So the signal is given by E to the minus TE over T2 star. So if we minimize TE, we can get a decent image. And here's the, this image now with a very short TE, and the signal intensity at the sinus is recovered. OK, so far so good. Only problem is, yes? Actually, the increase is because the T2 star can only produce a decrease in signal. So it increases the signal. But there's another effect. What happens if one reduces the effect of T2 star relaxation on the image? Contrast. We lose contrast. We're no longer able to see changes in T2 star. So we want T2 weighting in the image to get a T2 weighted image. So that's no good, this solution. And so the solution is to use a spin echo. We'll come to the last difficult part of this semester, and that is the spin echo formation, called also Hahn spin echo, named after Erwin Hahn. So the observation that one makes is one, if one applies two RF pulses in relatively short sequence, one observes a echo in the MR signal, that is suddenly an increase in the signal at twice the time difference between the two RF pulses you assume a constant gradient. So we'll assume now this case to make it simple. We'll just assume we have a constant gradient. 
over time. We're applying an RF pulse, and we'll make it for the simplicity an RF pulse of 90 degrees. So it flips all the magnetization into the transverse plane. And we'll have another RF pulse, and for simplicity of the argument, we'll assume this is a 180 degree pulse. So it flips the magnetization by 180 degrees. So it's practically twice in duration as this one. This is TE half, this time period. And this is another time period, TE half. And at this point, that's the observation. One will observe a spin echo. So what happens? After the 90 degree X pulse, the magnetization that was first along Z, we can consider it the uh, equilibrium magnetization, is tilted into the Y direction. That's the state A, denoted by the letter A. And now we're going to look at what's happening in the transverse plane, starting with state A, that's here. We're going to look at four magnetization vectors. Any four magnetization vectors, doesn't matter what they are, just to illustrate the principle, what's happening. Okay, so now what's happening is the same thing that we've seen before. We'll first have dephasing. These four, these four spins are assumed to be at different points in space in this direction of the gradient, let's say in Y. That's the physical coordinate Y. And as we now transverse from here to here, we'll see the effect. They will precess with different frequencies because they have different magnetic field at their position. And now we're at the state just before the amplification of the 180 degree pulse. Now this 180 degree pulse in the rotating reference frame is applied along Y. So what I'm showing here now is the rotating reference frame. This is the Y dimension. This is the X dimension. So this is the state at position B. Magnetization has dephased. And now we'll apply a 180 degree pulse along Y. So what this will do, it will rotate everything by 180 degree pulse. Think where the blue vector is going and the green one. Remember the blue one went this way, the red one went this way. Let's focus on the red one and the blue one. If you rotate now by 180 degrees around this axis, the component that's in this direction will not change. It's only the X component that will flip the sign. So this is what happens. Do you see it? We go back to the pulse. So we're before the pulse here. We'll go right after the pulse, RF pulse. Since it's a 180 degree rotation, only the X component will change sign. This means the vector flips over on the other side. The Y component stays constant. Now what happens to the blue and the red vector? This is state C now after the flip. And so if you're flipping around 180 degrees along Y, it's only the X component that changes sign. The Y component does not, so sine phi goes to sine minus phi or minus sine phi. And phi is here, of course, given by the influence of the gradient between the RF pulses. So now what happens after the RF pulse? We have seen blue precesses in this direction. It will not change its direction, nor the frequency of precession. So is the red magnetization vector. So I've just moved these two vectors that indicate the direction to illustrate where it's going. Blue was faster. It still continues in the same direction. Red was slower, but going in the opposite direction. We'll still go in the same direction with the same frequency. So now if we go on, what happens now between C and D is we will have rephasing. And after the time TE, all the magnetization vectors will be in phase again, collinear, and therefore produce maximum signal, which is what we define as an echo. And so now we have a spin echo in this case. So what does this mean? This means, in this case, we had a constant gradient. GY is constant. This is our static magnetic field in homogeneity. And if you apply a 90 degree and 180 degree pulse, the static field in homogeneity is being refocused, produce an echo. The magnetization vectors will come back together at time TE and produce maximal signal.
And so with this, it is possible to still generate an image even in the presence of T2 star uh, imperfections of the main magnetic field. OK, so the mag if you look at it in complex space, transverse magnetization has a certain phase. If you do 180 degree along Y, so along this direction, then this just results in flipping the imaginary part, and that's the same thing as writing e to the minus i phi. OK, so basically creates a rotation similar to a rotation. If you're more comfortable with how I described echo formation with changes in gradients, you can think of what the gradient, what the 180 degree pulse is equivalent to a virtual change in the amplitude of this gradient at this point. In terms of coherence generation, it is identical to what we had before, except we can, in reality, one cannot change the static magnetic field imperfections. So one cannot change their sign at the po position of the 180 degree pulse. And since this gradient is also spatially dependent, one would have to create a very complex machine to theoretically be possible able to do that. OK, so to conclude, 180 degree pulses are able to refocus magnetization in the presence of a constant gradient or static field in homogeneity, in homogeneity and therefore generate uh, an echo and maximal signal. OK, so this was the pictorial presentation. Let's go through this quickly on the mathematical basis. We have an RF field. It gives us a flip angle here. We start out with magnetization before the uh, RF pulse at along Z. We rotate it by alpha degrees. This gives us um, a Z magnetization, a Y magnetization that's given by MZ times sine alpha. And then the Z magnetization that's left is MZ times cosine alpha. And we'll now, from now on, only consider the transverse magnetization. What's along Z does not interest us. So we're now considering just MXY, which precesses with a uh, magnetic field that's given by gamma GX times X. And this is positive. So we'll now just look at the effect of the gradient. This is TE. And at point, time point 3 is we have now the effect of this gradient is given by um, this effect. This produces essentially a rotation in a transverse plane that's spatially dependent. And I'll consider just one particular position in space. So in, for a particular position in X, we have an angle phi associated with the magnetization vector at time point 3. And now we're applying the 180 degree pulse. That pulse inverts the y com if that pulse is applied about x, it inverts the y component of mxy. So M my is um, flipped into minus my. That's at position 4. So the magnetization of position 4 is equal to the, the magnetization of position 3, except the y component is inverted. That can be written as my times cosine phi x sine minus phi x, and this is identical to the effect of a negative gradient, and therefore produces a echo. Because I can, of course, write here, instead of phi x, I can write minus phi x, cosine of phi x, and minus phi x is the same thing. And then you can see this is the effect of as if, in the first period, everything has been rotated by minus phi x, and then the gradient that goes on from here will rotate it in the opposite direction. OK, so if you look at the signal as a function of TE, the signal is proportional to transverse magnetization. For T2, it's an exponential decay. We've dealt with that. And for T2 star, also an exponential decay, near exponential, and that's for the gradient echo. So you have T2 with a spin echo, T2 star with a gradient echo. Here's the relationship, the empirical relationship. So T2 star relative to T2 gives you some in inference on the magnetic field in homogeneity that's within 
the, the voxel of the imaging sequence. And this term is unavoidable because of the fact that B0 cannot be homogeneous in, in space. And actually, this is exploited in bold fMRI. So usually, that's typical for MRI. If you've got a problem, you've got an application. In this case, the problem is that static field homogeneities affect the signal in a negative way, but that one can exploit in functional imaging. T2 is always longer than T2 star. You cannot have a T2 star that's longer than T2, because this term is positive, this term is positive, and this term is positive. So this term here has to be always bigger, so T2 star has to be smaller than T2. OK, and this brings us to the spin echo imaging sequence. And then we'll go through the basic contrast that the spin echo imaging sequence can generate. Just like with the gradient echo sequence, we'll start out with a RF pulse, in this case, a 90 degree pulse. We have the psi select gradient, the rephaser here. The areas being equal gives us the echo. And now the difference is we'll turn, we'll turn on the slice select gradient one more time for the 180 degree pulse. So that the 180 degree pulse only affects the magnetization in the imaging plane. This is the frequency and co gradient. Notice one difference compared to the gradient echo sequence. The dephaser here is now positive because it's on the other side of the 180 degree pulse. Remember, I said before, the 180 degree pulse acts as if one had inverted the gradient. So there we need to keep it now positive. These two areas are the same. This gives us now the echo at this point here. So this, is, this defines now the echo time. The signal occurs at this point when this integral is equal to this integral. Here comes the phasing co-gradient. That's the same for both imaging sequences. And that's the basic um, spin echo sequence that is used. OK, so now what about the signal? How is the signal affected by um, relaxation? The signal is proportional to the transverse magnetization observed at this point. The proton density in the tissue is proportional to the equilibrium magnetization. So the transverse magnetization is given by the sine of 90 degrees times the Z magnetization that was just before that pulse. So it's O minus. Transverse magnetization at TE is given by the transverse magnetization at time 0 here times e to the minus TE over T2. And now it's T2, not T2 star. What about the longitudinal magnetization? That is given by the magnetization beforehand. Uh, the longitudinal magnetization before the RF pulse is given by this term because we're applying 90 degree pulses. So it's actually a simpler um, description. So of course, to generate an image, this is repeated every TR seconds. We have to generate a two-dimensional matrix, step through the phase and co-gradient. And so our signal for the spin echo sequence with a 90 degree pulse, and we'll stay for that for the course, we'll only consider this sequence, is it's proportional to the density of the, of the uh, proton density, 1 minus E to the power of minus TR over T1. That's the T1 relaxation effect with a 90 degree excited pulse. And E to the minus TE over T2 is the effect of T2 relaxation. So that's all there is. That's the operational equation. Now we'll go through the different contrasts, um, how to obtain them. So what are the basic MRI contrast mechanisms, the standard stuff that one uses? We'll first start with proton density weighted MRI. To get the proton density, one wants to minimize the effects of relaxation. So we have, we, in a proton density weighted image, one wants to measure the density of protons, that is, something proportional to the equilibrium magnetization. So let's look first at the defect of T1. We want to minimize this term here, so the choice has to be a long TR. In this term, for a long TR, this term goes to 0, and one just has 1 here. So a typical example here is 3 and a half seconds. 
At this point, this is for brain, white, gray matter, CSF, and fat. They're all pretty much relaxed to the equilibrium magnetization. So in this case, now we can forget about T1 relaxation. One has to just be sure that the TR is sufficiently long, that these effects are negligible. What about the T2 effect? How can one minimize the effect of T2 on the image contrast? So we want this term not to depend on T2. Oh, well, best thing is we set TE equals zero, right? And this, this term is always one. Okay, now this is technically not possible, but what one does is one chooses a very short TE, the shortest possible that one can uh, with the, within the experimental capabilities. If one uses a TE that's short compared to T2, then TE over T2 becomes close to zero. This term is close to one and hardly varies with changes in T2. So um, one will choose something around 10 milliseconds or so at this point. And then the differences between the different tissues are very small. Small difference between tissues, small difference between tissues for T1, and so one obtains the density-weighted image. And that's imaging, essentially, the number of protons that are present in a voxel. Consequences, tissues with a high density of protons will have a stronger signal, for example, water-filled spaces like cerebrospinal fluid, like the, the cyst we saw at the beginning of the course, or fat, they'll be very bright. The downside is, if one looks at water, the water content varies between 70 and 100 percent. That's not a big dynamic range to detect a lesion, so it's poor contrast. Okay, now how is T2 contrast weighted, uh, generated? And this is contrast now based on T2, differences between tissues. So we want to minimize the effect of T1. So we're going to look at, again, the same graph here. The story is the same. We want to minimize T1, so one loses a long TR. There's a reduced effect of T1, and if you look at the, the graphical depiction, and for these different tissues here, they're pretty similar, and changes in T1 will have little effect on image intensity. So a long TR is used. One can forget about this term because it's essentially close to 1. But one wants to use longer echo time TE to accentuate the differences between the different tissues, the differences in T2. So what one does is use a TE that is appropriate to see differences in T2, and that's, you can see for different tissues, CSF, gray matter, white matter, and fat, the differences in T, T, T2. So what is the optimal TE that one can use? How does one derive that? We have the equation at the top of the screen here. How does one find out what's the optimal TE? Well, this is essentially to find the TE at which point changes in T2 have the biggest effect on the transverse magnetization. And the solution is actually the same way than the solution that we did in lecture one and afterwards. We use variational calculus. So we're looking for the TE at which the derivative of the transverse magnetization with respect to T2 is maximal. And I won't go through, I'll just give you the steps again. It's the same thing. But what one finds is the best TE to use to see changes in T2 is the TE that is equal to T2. Question, of course, is what does one do if one has more than one T2? T2A and T2B, species A and species B. One wants to optimize the contrast, having knowing that these two T2s are present. Then the TE has to be somewhere between the two. You can actually calculate that. Um, um, given uh, uh, specific values, one can actually derive that. But as a rule of thumb, it's somewhere between the T2. So in this example here, for these, this particular case, these T2s that are present, the optimal TE would be around 100 milliseconds. So spin echo sequence would be 3.5 seconds to repetition time and an echo time of 100 milliseconds. Now, the last part is T1-weighted imaging. 
You can probably guess how this is going. We're just cycling through the same terms again. Here's the, the equation for the spin echo sequence. Now we want to minimize the effect of T2. And this is done by looking at the T2 decay. And we're minimizing the effect of T2 by short, shortening the TE. So we don't want T2 to be an influence in the contrast. And so one chooses a short TE. Something like 10 milliseconds is very good. And so that term can be neglected. Now one wants to just optimize the TR. So one detects the T1 changes. One wants to use a relatively short TR to accentuate those. Here's the example. And um, the choice of TR comes into play to minimize the differences in the return to equilibrium magnetization. So here it's no good, small differences. Here it's no good, small differences. Somewhere in to between it's maximal. And in this case, it's around 600 milliseconds. Consequences, tissues with short, with, with short T1 have higher image intensity. So again, the question is, what is the optimal choice of TR? And I will keep it simple here. It's the same that we've had for before, a few weeks back, two weeks back, I think, three weeks, actually. And it is a choice of TR that's equals to T1. It's the same cal procedure to calculate it like, we've like you've, you've done with T2 um, or for other imaging sequences. So if one is interested in measuring T1 contrast, short TR, short TE. If one is interested in measuring T2 contrast, long TR, long TE. If one is interested in proton density, short TE, long TR. You can screw yourself with an experiment. You do a, an experiment with short TR and long TE. Then you've accentuated both T2 contrast and T1 contrast, and you'll end up with no signal, therefore no contrast. So that's why it's important to consider the different relaxation effects on the image. So we'll go some, through some examples. This is a T1-weighted image. And uh, below the image, I've given you the parameters so you have an idea what is TR, to get an idea of what it means in real life. So 510 milliseconds is the TR, 14 milliseconds the TE. This is a density weighted, 4.5 seconds TR, 15 milliseconds TE. This is a T2 weighted image, 4.5 seconds TR, and about 100 milliseconds TE. Gives you an idea of the um, order of magnitude of these parameters, T1s and T2s. Notice the difference in the fluid. So fluid here, cerebrospinal fluid, is bright and T2-weighted, has a long T2. On the T1-weighted here, it's dark. It has a long T1. But we're doing T1-weighting by reducing the TR, so signal with long T1 has, magnetization with long T1 has weaker signal. So this is, to exemplify this a bit more uh, critical, here's the fluid space, fluid field space. It's dark on T1, bright on T2, even though T1 and T2 are both uh, longer. I should say dark on T1 weighted image and bright on T2 weighted image. This is a T1 weighted image of the knee. And this is from the legs. So fat has a short T1 compared to muscle. This is the muscle tissue. This is the fat tissue. So fat tissue shows up very bright in these images. And here we see actually the bone, which has no signal at all. There the T2 is so short that you have no chance of recovering it. And in this particular patient here has a lipoma, so a, a lesion that ha is a lipid field. OK, so water in tissue, when it has a short T1, it typically has a short T2. If it has a long T1, it typically has a short long T2. How you generate the contrast and how that represents itself depends on how the contrast is generated. And that's why you get long T2 bright here and long T1 dark. OK, here's an example of T2-weighted image of cancer. 
This is um, a liver cancer met metastasis, two big tumors. This is a T2 weighted image of a tumor in the brain. Here's the tumor, and around you see also bright T2 weighted image. That's actually edema. So there's a reduction in, in cellularity of the tissue. More, more water is in there, and that creates an increase in T2. This is a T1 weighted image of a mouse with a xenografted tumor. You can hardly see on the T1 weighted image the tumor here. If you look at the T2 weighted image, now you can see that the tumor has grown here on this side. And this gives you the idea of the parameters, 2 seconds and 40 milliseconds. So cancer is typically better detected on T2 weighted images. And here is other examples of experimental tumors. Here's a tumor that was grown in the T2 weighted image, very bright. And this is a particular type of cell where the question was, does this cell grow tumors or not? OK, and I'll conclude today's talk with an example of um, how contrast agents, what are contrast agents, and how do they affect uh, signal intensity. Um, I'll give just a brief introduction to their theory, and then end the course with a few examples on MRI contrast agents. So contrast agents, essentially, in MRI, affect the basic contrast mechanisms. And that is T1 and T2 and T2 star. So they're affecting the signal intensity by changing the relaxation time. And we classify the contrast agents into two types. One is the paramagnetic agents. They have, they have mainly a influence on T1 through interaction um, of the contrast agent with the water molecules that pass through the contrast agent. And therefore, the water molecules change their relaxation time, T1. I won't go into too much into molecular details here. The contrast agent is essentially described, the effect on T1 is described by the contrast agent T1. So that's the T1 of the water in the presence of the contrast agent. is given by the diamagnetic T1 or the intrinsic T1 of the water plus this term times the contrast agent concentration. So this term R1 is called relaxivity. It describes the ability of a contrast agent at unit concentration to affect the T1. So to give you an example, if you have a contrast agent of 1 millimolar with a relaxivity of 3 per millimolar per second, and you have a T1 to start out with 1 second, then if you plug this into this equation here, you'll find that 1 millimolar of the contrast agent reduces the T1 from one second to 250 millisecond. That's a fourfold reduction. That's a strong effect. OK, so if one looks at it, the signal proportion to the Z magnetization, since it's T1 weighted, we'll look at this expression here. We'll assume that the TE was short enough so we can neglect T2. This is our normal re relaxation to steady state magnetization, and in the presence of the contrast agent, the Z magnetization will just relax faster. So what does this mean now, what's happening on the image? We're getting a brighter signal, because we're essentially measuring a short TR. At this point, signal is where the contrast agent doesn't go, the signal is dark. And where the contrast agent goes, the signal gets bright. Contrast agents that are so-called paramagnetic or susceptibility agents are those that act on T2 or T2 star. So T2 star agents are called susceptibility agents. For obvious reasons, the expression that one uses to describe their effect is the same thing. So 1 over T2 star in the presence of the contrast agent is given by the native T2 star, 1 over T2 star times the concentration plus the concentration times the R2 star relaxivity. That's a constant that's experimentally determined. So if one looks at the signal, which now is proportional to transverse magnetization, that's in the absence of contrast agent, it decays somewhat in a gradient deco, and in the presence of the contrast agent, it decays faster. So contrast agents can only work by reducing the relaxation time. 
They cannot increase it. It's the only way that they can act. And so, to give you an example here, starting out with a one millimolar contrast agent, this is a typical relaxivity of 50 per second per millimolar and a T2 star of 50 milliseconds. This produces, plugging this into this equation, produces a T2 star in the presence of the contrast agent of 14 milliseconds. That's a threefold reduction in T2 star. Again, easily measurable, easily detectable if you only have one millimolar of the contrast agent present. The difference is T2 star contrast agents, their effect is observed by a reduction of the signal. They produce a black signal, a reduction of the signal. T1 agents produce an increase of the signal. T2 star contrast agents, if you measure a TE here, optimal for the native T2 star in the tissue. At that point, in the presence of one millimolar contrast agent, the signal will have decayed. Okay, I'll take me a few minutes to give you the examples, but take this here. If you measure at 50 milliseconds, that's the optimum for the tissue without contrast agent. You have one millimolar of the contrast agent present. T2 star has been reduced by a factor of three, so the signal is now decayed by 95%. So it's essentially black. So that's what one needs to, to keep in mind for the effect of the contrast agents. So, typically they are restricted to the blood, the contrast agents. They're ideal to image vessels or leaky vessel walls, typically tumors or inflammation. Here's an example of the vessel architecture in a mouse. This is MRI of a mouse trunk showing the aorta after the contrast agent application. This is a very typical example for tumors. You give a typical element is catalinium. It's paramagnetic. It produces T1 contrast. And what you see here, this is before contrast application. And after you see this rim here that's bright, that's showing a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And that is a typical for a rim of a tumor. This is now negative contrast from iron oxide. Iron oxide is a T2 star agent. This is the liver. You can see something that's not quite right here. The iron oxide contrast went everywhere in the liver except in this malignant lesion here that it didn't go. So this shows up now very clearly in the image after the contrast agent um, application. There's another class of relatively not so freak contrast agents, and those are the intracellular contrast agents. One is manganese. Manganese is paramagnetic, shorts T1. And it has a nice feature, it's transported by calcium channels. So it's a way to measure calcium channel activity. And this is an example in the brain. So calcium channel activity is linked to neuronal activity. And after the application of manganese, one can see very nicely the structure in the hippocampus here. This is before manganese and after. You can see there's a strong indication of, of the cytoarchitecture of the brain now linked to synaptic activity in the animal. Another example that's quite interesting is imaging stem cells or individual cells. The experiment that's being done there is that the cells, before they're injected, they are the contrast agent is introduced into the cell. So they're preloaded with contrast agent. And this is an example of from the field of diabetes. So islet transplantation is one method of treating type 1 diabetes. They can still produce insulin. And in this case, the question was, where do the islets go? So the islets were isolated, loaded with a contrast agent, and then injected into the patient and they end up actually dislodged in the liver. Here, these dots show the accumulation of the Langerhans islets in the liver in this patient. This is also used for imaging migration of um, migrating cells, such as stem cells in, in other contexts, neural, neuronal progenitor cells, etc. cetera. Um, and at this point, one is able to image the, the migration of individual cells in some instances. Okay, so that's it for today. Next week we'll deal with advanced contrast mechanisms. That's blood flow.
how to image blood flow in vessels, and we'll also deal with diffusion. It's a very nice topic because after that course you have a few more days of lectures and then you, I guess you will diffuse pretty much into all sorts of different directions.